So we are live now on the Double Your Business show in 90 days talking about how to grow your money. And if you missed a little bit of the preamble that Jenny's already been sharing with us, you know, we've talked about three different ways that you could raise money for your business. I think so many um, small businesses get stuck in the fact that they don't see any money in their bank account. And so they think if there's no money in my bank account, I can't grow. And, you know, today's show is really about don't just look at your bank account. There's more than one way to skin a cat. And I do have cats. So don't worry if that offended. Um, I have three cats and I love them. There's actually one sitting right next to me over here. But, you know, my point is, is that as an entrepreneur, you can have one of two mindsets. You can have this worker mindset that just sees the problem. And the problem that they see is I have no money in my bank account. I have no money. I have no money. I can't do any of these things. Um, and then or you can have this entrepreneurial mindset. An entrepreneurial mindset says, well, if I don't have any money, who does? And let me go Other find people. it. <laughs> Other people have money. And so that's what we're talking about today is really about finding that money. And I brought on our expert, uh, Jenny Kassan, to talk to us about crowdfunding. And if you're just joining us, you might have missed some of her explanation. You know, we're not necessarily talking about the GoFundMes and the Kickstarter campaigns, although that is one um, method that a lot of people are very familiar with. You know, I asked her if we were talking about the shark tank and we're not really talking about the shark tank. We are kind of almost talking about a blend between the two using um, small investments for our people that are going to invest in our companies into our business and then be able to use that to grow our business. So I'm excited to have you on the show, Jenny. Is this your first blab? It is. Yay, Blab. Okay, if you're listening, let's give let's give Jenny some props there for her first Blab. Um, we'll have people come on. I know we've got um, several people on across the United States so far. Jenny, there's this little map in your upper right-hand corner, and it will show us. And as we get going, a lot more people will be coming on. Long, coming on. So if you're hearing us talk today, make sure you're, you're um, sending us a in the chat and sending us questions because we want to take your questions. We will be having people join us um, later on. If you're catching the replay on iTunes, know that you can catch this show live Monday afternoons, 1.30 over here at Blab. Um, so we'll be doing that. So I just wanted to kind of start off with really um, why I wanted to have this show topic today, because there really are four points of leverage that you can have in your business. Now, you can be a very tiny business, a solopreneur, all the way up to having, you know, tens, twenties, a hundred employees out there. But these same points of leverage will work for you. So let me tell you what they are. Um, so the first one is going to be about uh, technology. Oh, actually, Amy's got our image ready to share. So we're going to share that in the chat and you can just click over to it. This is fun. This is something new we're trying today to see how that works. But you should. Well, it might work. There it goes. All right. Oh, no, it won't share it with me, Amy. <laughs> we are trying to we're trying some new stuff on the show. And that's really about learning and growing. Right. But really, when you look at those four points of leverage, let me tell you what they are. The first one is money. That's what we're talking about today. The second one's going to be people. So you can leverage people in order to grow your business. The third one is going to be about systems. And then the last one, everyone's absolute favorite one is technology. That's what we're doing today, right? We're leveraging technology in a way um, to help you grow your business um, to do things like that. So Jenny's here as one of our money experts. Jenny, I don't. will you share with me and sharing what some of these six components of money leverage are and which one? Um, obviously, you love outside funding and investment. So that can be first one, right? Why do you love outside funding and investment so much? There's so many reasons, you know, just being able to bring your community and people that love you and want to support you. And, and a lot of people, when they think of who an investor might be, they think of, a scary guy in a suit, you know, but investors can be a lot of different people. My understanding is that, yes, there are a lot of people in our country who don't actually have that hundred dollars or a thousand dollars to invest. But I think about 50% of the population has some investment already. So that's a huge number of people that can invest in your business and to enroll people in that way and help them share in your success is just so amazing. I mean, it's, 
it really up levels your business. It's a little scary sometimes because you have these people counting on you to do well in your right. business. But I think it's so worth it because you end up just, you know, really thinking through everything you do in a way that it just holds you more accountable and you end up really up leveling. That's been my experience. I really up, up leveled my business when I brought on investors. And they were there to support me. I mean, they want, they were so invested in my success. They would introduce me to people that could help me. You know, they would introduce me to other investors, to suppliers, to customers. So it just creates this whole community of support that is totally invested in your success. And, you know, if they happen to be your customers, I have some clients that have had their customers invest in them. And when a customer invests, the, stu the, the studies show that they double their purchases from you when they're an investor. Wow. Yeah. So That's that, really interesting. Plus, it just really sets you apart. Like, you can do, a, I found that um, you can get a lot of media attention if you announce I'm raising money from my community, from my customers. My, I have like 100 investors and they're all my customers. So you get a lot of free publicity when you do that. Well, I like what you're sharing. So there's one component of this. Um, I have a colleague, Bridget Chambers, that goes into big corporations and helps them turn around. And she and I were talking one day and she goes, you know, gone is the day when you really can be successful in the silo. We need each other. You need that support. You need somebody to push you beyond the limits that you might be pushing. You might push yourself. I know I do a lot better when I have to answer to somebody because um, I don't want to let them down, you know, but if it's just me, myself and I, maybe I get a little relaxed there. So uh, yeah, thanks, Bambi. Mm -hmm. Glad you joined us, joined in. We're talking about um, really the ways of leveraging money. So the first one is crowdfunding and investment. And we're going to talk a lot, little bit more about that. So second one, let's see what second one is. What's your next favorite one on the list, Jenny? You know what? I'm so sorry, but I'm not seeing which list are we talking about here? Oh, well, we haven't put it up yet. Okay. Uh, it's part of the, in the show notes, though. So, um, but I know one that I like to talk about is about sweat equity partnerships. Um, and that's really where you find somebody that maybe it's a corporation, maybe it's a supplier, you know, like you were talking about, same people that would be eligible for partnerships and investment, but they have marketing budgets and maybe you do not. And so when you're looking at things like um, sweat equity partnerships, you're saying, I'm going to come up with the marketing idea. I'm going to make it a win-win for everyone. My partners pay for it and I do all the work. So that's kind of that sweat equity kind of partnership way to grow a business. Um, so we've got two that we've talked about so far. We've talked about the outside funding and an investment um, and then the sweat equity partnerships. But there are a lot of other ways to use people, other people's money as far as um, growing your business. And I'm going to shoot Jenny a quick little thing over here. I see it. I see it now. I'm sorry about oh, that. Oh, there you go. No worries. <laughs> That's the lovely nature of, of Blab, right? Is It's a little bit of an impromptu out there. Um, it's the wild, wild west. And so as long as we keep rolling with the punches, we're doing pretty well out there. So I know we've got um, a couple more people have just joined in. Amy, you want to give some shout outs up there? Yeah, absolutely. So um, you already welcomed Bambi Thompson to join us. And we have... Um, someone we have foo plugins who just joined us and um then there's also um i'm sorry there's also wafa that joined us <laughs> so those are our, our most recent joint joins in it's and it's adam. adam thank you that's the hard part right is that we just see the handle sometimes <laughs> So uh, we're talking about doubling your business in 90 days, how to grow your business. And we're kind of going over the six ways that you can have money, um, leverage money. So we've talked about, you know, obviously Jenny's favorite way of outside funding and investment. Um, we've talked about, you know, sweat equity partnerships. I don't know what other ways um, is there on there. I've still got a couple favorites in there. Jenny, what do you think? Well, I see something on there that says invest in standing on the shoulders of giants. And I have yeah. to say, nothing has made a bigger difference for me. It, I And I'm guessing what you mean by that. But just having mentors that have grown their businesses in a way that you admire and really working with them is just absolutely amazing. I mean, I, I cannot say how big a difference that's made for me. I have a mentor that... 
um, I just came back from a retreat with her and it was it's it's so important and one thing she always says is if you are asking people to invest in you whether as a customer or as an investor and you haven't invested in yourself by yeah. you know having you know having mentors in your life that you know guess what they charge money to work with them so going ahead and investing in that it's really hard to go to you know with integrity go out and ask others to invest in you if you haven't made some investments yourself in mentors and uh, and you know supporting the kinds of suppliers that you want to work with or, or or service providers um saying you know what i I'm not going to pay for the bottom of the barrel, you know, lowest mm -hmm. common denominator web designer, you know, I'm going to pay that higher price because I value my business and I value myself. If you start to have that attitude of investing in yourself, you will find that, you know, others will be way more drawn to investing in you. And that's, I love that one. And it is really important. That's probably the one that does require money out of your own pocketbook. I've got to, I've got to go there. Or um, investors, you can use investors money to do that. Oh, there you go. Very good point. <laughs> These are all the things that investors can help you do. But I do like the the whole concept. And really for me, the standing on shoulders, the shoulders of giants you know the show is called double your business in 90 days and most people they haven't worked with me think oh she's smoking crack mm -hmm. you know or you know we're over promising but i'm not i'm telling you the ways to get it done because it can happen and sometimes you do have to pay for those experts because they can get your results in your business quicker than you can get them by yourself and so if you want results some days yeah you do have to stretch but this is really interesting and jenny i'll see if this has happened to you and Amy can even chime in, but I have never been able to afford that shoulder of the giant that I've invested in. I never have. Mm -hmm. I've always had to go out and create the income or like you're saying, you're going to share with us, you know, find the investors that are willing to help support that in order to do that. How about you? Is that the same for you? Do you always have the money sitting in the bank for it? No. That <laughs> <laughs> never works that way. <laughs> Yeah, yeah, I have. I've had to really stretch to find it, and um, so, but the minute I do, I think that's again, it's almost similar to what I said about bringing on investors. Like when you stretch and you do something that's outside your comfort zone, and it's scary, and you're putting money that you don't have, and you're getting into debt, uh, you're putting it on your credit card. It really causes you to up level your business, and I have, you know, definitely made a, you know, the money back that I've invested in those kinds of things. So cool. Okay, so we got three more. So we've talked about outside funding and investment. We've talked about sweat equity partnerships, um, investing on the shoulders of giants, and really what we're talking about here. There's six different ways that you can really use money leverage to grow your business. So I'm gonna go for number two because I always love this, and I think in the information world we understand this concept of you get paid to build it, meaning you don't have to have a perfect product, you don't have to have it even fully fleshed out. You just get paid to build it. So I know if some of our listeners um, listen to people like Pat Flynn with Smart Passive Income, um, there's a lot of this that people do in the in the information world about seeing if it's marketable. It's kind of like testing it, see if it's a viable idea before you spend all that um, time in building it so i don't know have anybody online or in our chat room have any experience where they've gotten paid first they've sold the idea first and isn't this what investing is jenny isn't this what it is it's getting paid to build it yeah that's a really good huh? point yeah because I, i've had clients that weren't a hundred percent sure which direction they were going to go you know which aspect of their business they were going to really work on and they've been able to raise money so that's a bit of a misconception is a lot of people i talk to i hate to say it but especially women think that oh you know my business has to be totally perfect and totally uh -huh. clear and i have to know for sure that i'm going to make all this money in the next two years or whatever before <laughs> i can bring on investors and that's not true i mean i've had clients that were incredibly early stage in their business and raised over a million dollars from investors just by telling their story and why they were passionate about what they were doing. And they didn't know for sure exactly what was going to happen and how it was going to work. But be because the investors could see their passion, they, yeah. were, they were able to attract the right people to come in and invest. 
Awesome. And you know, that kind of, when you have that investment in your company, you really can start creating these two other forms of income, can't you? And that's kind of our last two ways of really leveraging money. But that's number one is, and the, I, guys, I consider these kind of advanced yoga moves <laughs> a little bit like you need some stability in your business and then you go after these kinds of things. Um, but, you know, number one is creating that multiple streams of income. And I'll go back to it again. If you have an investment strategy and getting investments, that's income into the business. And so that can fuel growth. Um, but our, and then our last one is passive income. So that's the, you know, getting paid while you sleep type of thing. So generally that's informational products, consumables, um, things of that nature. So those are those are our six. So we've talked about just as a review, um, sweat equity partnerships, getting paid to build it, investing um, in the standing on the shoulders of giants, you know, creating multiple streams of passive of income, passive income, and then outside funding and investment. Okay, so that's all the learning we're going to do today. Well, kind of, you know, all the classroom style learning that we're going to do today. <laughs> um, guys, if you're listening in, you've got some questions for Jenny or for myself, please feel free to ask us in the in the chat box. We're going to kind of go on. So we've been talking about crowdfunding, but I know we've got some new people on. So I want you to just kind of share with us again what um, your expertise is in. And I think it's a way that most people haven't considered about um, for raising money for their business. Yeah, it's actually a really exciting time in the world of crowdfunding because um, so so the first distinction to be aware of is there's really two general types of crowdfunding. So one is that you offer some kind of a perk or just like a big thank you um, to people who donate to your business. So you may go on a website like Kickstarter, Indiegogo, and uh, say, yeah, I'm trying to raise a thousand dollars, and you know, if you give me five dollars, I'll thank you on my website. If you give me twenty-five, I'll give you a T-shirt. So that's called perks-based or donation-based uh, crowdfunding, and that's a huge thing. I mean, that's been going on for a while now. Some people have raised a lot of money doing that, but unfortunately, you know, you hear about these big success stories with that. But the most common outcome is you don't have a ton of success, or maybe you raise a thousand or two thousand, which is nice, you know. But it's it's very hard to raise significant amounts of money using that strategy because you're really not offering something of huge value in return. And mm -hmm. and also, um, even if you are, sometimes people do. But even still, there's so many people doing those campaigns right now that people are kind of tired of it and and burnt out on it. They're kind of a dime a dozen right now. Well, the way in looking at, you know, that as a means of, of investment, it seems to me that the ones that do the most success, A, have a complete marketing campaign behind it, and they are marketing the bejeebus out of it. B, there's always some social element or social, you know, social cause behind it, or there's like an art reason, an expression reason, but not as many mom and pop regular businesses is what I see. So is that kind of help could help our audience understand one of the distinctions between if we're talking about this perk based crowdfunding and who it's who it's a good fit for and then the style of funding that you're talking to us mm -hmm. about today. Yeah, I mean I think there's a lot of tricks that go into having a successful one of those campaigns. Like for example, one thing I know that people do that to make it more successful is they will um they'll make sure they get a pre-commitment from people they know mm. before they even launch it because i guess studies show that if you, if it get if the first one third or one half gets funded fairly quickly it's much more likely you'll reach your goal so there's all kinds of tips to making that successful and yeah there's definitely businesses that have done it like um some one of the biggest ones ever a guy made like this um what was it like a a, a cooler for drinks uh -huh. um, and he was actually pre-selling the cooler. So that's oh. another kind of weird thing about that way of raising money is sometimes you're, you're actually pre-selling a product. And there's actually some legal issues with that. You have to be really careful with that. But anyway, to be honest with you, I'm really not an expert on that type of crowdfunding. <laughs> <laughs> and yes, there are tons of experts out there that you can hire that will <clears throat> help you do that kind of crowdfunding. I had one client that raised like 150000 on Kickstarter. So it's possible. but what I'm an expert on is investment crowdfunding, and that's where you're not offering a perk 
or pre-selling a product or a, like a, a thank you on your, or an acknowledgement on your website, but you're actually selling an investment opportunity. Okay. And an investment opportunity can be something where people are lending you money and you're promising to pay them back with interest. It can be something where you're selling equity in your company, like stock in your corporation or an interest in your LLC. Uh, there's many different ways to structure investment offerings. And of course, you do need a lawyer to do that right. right. But, but you'll find that that kind of crowdfunding where you're actually offering an investment opportunity is not very common. And that's because there are some legal hoops you have to jump through. The minute you're offering an investment opportunity, there's quite a lot of regulation that comes into play. And there are even, you know, not only are there in the general public, there's a lot of uh, misconceptions about what you can and can't do. There are even lots of lawyers that don't totally know what you can and can't do. And to make it even more complicated, there's act in 2012, a law called the Jobs Act was passed. Mm -hmm. I was actually at the White House for the signing ceremony. And, that, cool. and there were already quite a few ways that you could raise money doing, uh, you know, doing crowdfunding, uh, offering an investment. But that law actually created three new ways. And then a bunch of states created some more ways. So there's actually multiple legal ways that you can offer an investment opportunity to the crowd. But, you know, you can advertise it online. You can you know, stand up at an event and shout it out that you're offering an investment <laughs> opportunity. So, um, so, there, so it's a really exciting way to raise money, and yet not a lot of people are doing it, Yeah, which is kind of cool because unlike the other kind of crowdfunding, when you do it, you get a lot of attention. Pretty much all of my clients who are doing it are getting multiple um, recognitions in, in newspapers and magazines and TV shows. And in fact, I'm going to be on a radio show in about an hour to talk about one of my clients who's currently raising money that way. So um, you get tons of free publicity when you do it. Yeah. Because it's still not very common. Well, let's start with who is this type of funding good for? What kind of businesses? Well, um, because you do need to hire a lawyer and, it, and there's some expense involved dealing with kind of the regulatory issues, you probably want to be raising a, a fairly large amount, like I'd say probably a minimum of 100000 ideally maybe more like 250000 because um, depending on how you do it. Um, there's uh, there's one way that actually hasn't quite gone into effect yet, but will be going into effect this year. That's kind of exciting. There's actually it's called um, I don't even know what people one one term you might hear for it is Title Three uh, investment crowdfunding. It's something that went in, that was authorized by the 2012 Jobs Act, and it still hasn't quite gone into effect in terms of being able to do it. <laughs> Four <But> years later. <laughs> yeah. But pretty soon you are going to start to hear about platforms out there like Kickstarter, Indiegogo, um, but they are actually going to be a platform where you can offer an investment opportunity and raise, okay. you can raise up to $100,000 without having any particular special kind of um, financials. And if, okay. you if you want to raise over 100000 you do have to have reviewed financials, which costs some money. But that's going to be a really great place to raise amounts up to 100000 and the expense will be relatively low. But all the other ways do require a little bit more in the way of expense. So you, for those, you'd probably want to be raising more. So if you're a private, do you have to be a public company? I mean, most of the concept of really doing investments and selling shares or interest in things, uh, to my mind, always means that's the IPO way. Is yeah, this? No, that's what's so exciting about this is it's to it has nothing to do with an IPO. Like an I with an IPO, you have to be huge to do an IPO because right. you become a public company and j the cost to be a public company is so high. There's like all these filings you have to do mm -hmm. and so the great thing about this is that even though you're doing a public offering of an investment opportunity, you remain a private company. Okay. So you're, you're so you don't have to be super huge. You can be a private company. You can be really small. I mean, you, it, there's no minimum size at all. Okay. Awesome. I mean, when I raised money for my company, you know, it was pretty small. It was like most of the people who do this will have some kind of an entity set up like a corporation or LLC. Mm -hmm. But you could probably even do it as a sole proprietor. You couldn't offer equity then, because only an only a corporation or an LLC has equity. equity. But you could offer uh, you could offer to to 
to lend, you know, to borrow money from people. So like each person could give you like a thousand dollars or more mm-hmm. and you promise to pay them back with interest in five years. You know, you could do that and raise, you know, 20,000, 30,000. What are, what are some of your clients using the funds that they raise for? What are they, how are they using it to grow their business? Yeah, it's very diverse. You know, uh, some of my clients are businesses that have, that are pretty, um, it's going to take some time for them to reach break even. Mm -hmm. So they have a lot of expenses there. Maybe they're building like a, a, some kind of a software or they're having to hire people to help them with things that they just, that their revenues are just not coming in as fast as their expenses are growing. Yeah. It's very normal, by the way, you know, a lot of people think they have to be like breaking even from the get go, but so many, I mean, there are huge, like, isn't, I think Amazon like still has barely ever, you know, made a profit like after all these years. So it's super not as super normal that you aren't going to break even for a while. And if that's the case, you need investors to fund that period of time until you break even. Mm -hmm. Another thing, like when I raised money, my business was, you know, breaking even, but we wanted to, we were really excited about creating a video, like a really high quality video. And it was going to cost us like a lot of money. (laughs) And we also wanted to create some other tools that would help our clients, you know, have more success. So we didn't need to raise money, but it helped us fund some things that we really wanted to do to, to really make our business, you know, more attractive to our customers and be able to provide, you know, better services and do better marketing. You know, I have other clients where it's like, I need, I need a bricks and mortar space. Like I need a, I need money to be able to have a physical location or another client where they do composting, they pick up food waste from businesses and they need it. You know, so there's a million reasons why you might need to raise money and you don't even need to be a hundred percent specific with exactly how you're going to use the money. Your client, you know, your investors, um, as long as you explain the, the basic, you know, plan for your business and how you plan to pay them back. If you say, you know, if you give them a general idea of the kinds of things you're going to use it for, if it changes in the future, it's really not a big deal. You know, as long as you, you, you know, just close the things to them in the beginning that they need to know to make an informed decision. Awesome. Hey, Amy, I I noticed we've gotten a few more people on. Um, Jenny's sharing such great information. Who else can we give some shout outs to? Yeah, Rick Wolf uh, recently joined us, as did Christopher Alquist and Roland Millward. Awesome. Oh, and I think Katrina Jones just popped on. So thanks for joining us. That's the kind of fun thing about Blab is you can pop on, pop off as need be. Always catch the replays. Um, But we are talking about doubling your business in 90 days and how to do that without necessarily money of your own. And that's what uh, Jenny Kassan is here to share with us is really about using this kind of crowd investment, um, not to be confused with things like GoFundMe and Kickstarter and, and stuff like that, but really something that is not as well known as a form of really being able to build your business. So we've been talking about a couple things too. It's good for really a lot of people. You don't have to be a public company. You can be a private company. You can be any size of company. But the one the one kind of uh, stipulation that I heard Jenny share is just really you want to make sure that the level of investment that you're looking for is in alignment with the process. You know, that it's yeah, worth it for the process. Exactly. Yeah, so. unfortunately, uh, the, the regulators that, it, so back in 1929, we had a big stock market crash and the federal government passed laws to protect investors. And those laws are basically still in effect today. And so um, the they do, they have certain kind of ideas of ways to, that are more or less risky for investors. And one thing they get nervous about is public advertising of an mm-hmm. investment opportunity. So anytime you put out to the public that you're raising money, for, you know, that you're looking for investors, it's going to be more regulated than if you just talk to people one-on-one. So you definitely that- need a lawyer the, when you want to do that. But what I'm really excited to share with people is that there are many different ways to do it. And there's, you know, especially given this new law that, or the 2012 law that's still going into effect, um, there's more and more ways to do it. In fact, there are some states, there's quite a few states, I think like maybe 25 that um, have made it really, really easy. Um, 
So just be aware that there's many different ways and there may be a way that depending on what state you're in, you know, what, what, where your investors are, how much you're raising, et cetera, that, that can be affordable and, and um, workable for you. So I'm getting this image, you know, when I talk about how all the different ways there are to grow the business, there are 169 ways, but you really just need one good way. And I'm hearing that there, for what you're saying about this is there are a lot of different ways to do this, but you've got to find the right one way. And that's kind of where you come in and help and can help people really, you know, laser in on what the right way is. Now, I, I want to ask, because you've mentioned this a couple of times, that there are several ways to go about doing this and you shared with us um title three a little bit but you know maybe you have could you take a moment to share maybe one or two of the other ways that people can use this kind of um means of, of building up an investment base in their business sure it gets a little technical so um okay so there's uh so <laughs> the first thing you have to do is figure out your federal compliance strategy and so oh, golly yeah. <laughs> So there's a few different ways to do it on the federal level. So one is something called an interstate offering where you're only offering investments to opportunities to people in your state. And if okay. you're doing that, there's actually no federal re requirements at all, which is awesome. You don't have to do any federal filings. There's another federal compliance strategy where you can do multiple states, but you can only raise up to a million and you do have to do a simple federal filing. There's another way where if you happen to be a nonprofit, and this one is really exciting because a lot of people don't realize that nonprofits can raise money from investors, but they can in the form of uh, loans. So mm -hmm. if you're a nonprofit, you also are, are free uh, from a federal level. You don't have to worry about federal filings at all, and there's no cap. Um, then okay. under, the, under the new law, there's... Um, there's three new ways, but basically there's one way that's quite expensive to do, but you can raise up to 50 million. Wow. And then there's this new way that's going into effect this year where you can raise up to 1 million and that's that, and you can do it from all 50 states. And that way is going to be really interesting. I mean, it, we still have yet to see what it's going to look like, but that may be like the fastest, most affordable way that we have to date. Um, yeah. And so, yeah. So basically, so that's the federal side. Then you have to figure yeah. out the state side. So you, oh golly, maybe let's say you're in Georgia, and um, I'm trying to look at our map here and see where people are. But let's say you're, we've got somebody up in the upper, upper like New York or Vermont or somewhere up on that side of the country for sure. Okay. Well, I'm going to just use Georgia as an example because I happen to, it's at the top of my mind that. Um, yeah, go for it. So let's say you're in Georgia and you're like, I want to raise like a few hundred thousand or 25,000 or however much up to a million. And I, and I'm only going to raise money from people in Georgia. Well, you have the federal interest state exemption, so you don't have to worry about the federal, you know, filings or anything like that. And Georgia just happens to have a law that says you can go ahead and raise up to a million dollars, but, and all you have to do is fill out a very simple form. Okay. And the only, restriction is that each individual investor is capped on how much they can put in. So, and I think we have about 25 states now that have similar, have laws like that. And of course they're all different. So you have to make sure and really get a sense of what it is, what the case is in your particular state. But um, that's just one example of, of how you could do it fairly, extremely cheaply and easily. Okay. So I just have to ask two questions. Number one, I have a feeling there's not a lot of people like you out there doing what you're doing. Am I right? Yes, and I'm so sorry. I have to move a little bit, so don't be distracted by that. No, no yeah, worries, no worries. It's so true, and I don't know why that is exactly. I don't know why there aren't more lawyers who have taken to the time to learn all of these details. Um, I have a feeling it's because most lawyers work at law firms where they, to be able to make the amount of money they need to make, they need to work with clients that are raising large amounts of money. So they don't bother working with, um, with people that are raising like 10,000, 25,000, even 250,000. And so they just don't bother with, with learning about it. And that's who I love to work with. So, um, Sorry, I'm looking for my power cord because my <laughs> we're about you're going zero zero zero. <laughs> <laughs> I'm so sorry. I found it. No I found it. Okay. Okay. Um, well, and then 
the yeah. second question I had was because this is such a specialized um, area, are you able to work with people outside of your state? Like, can yeah. you work with anybody across the country? Yeah, I can work with people all over the country because even though the laws are somewhat diverse, I mean, there's the federal law, obviously, which applies to everyone. And then the states all have their own laws, but there are quite a few similarities between them. So I, I'm pretty comfortable working in all states. I mean, in a perfect world, you'd have a, an expert in your state. But if you mm. don't, I can certainly help you figure out, you know, what the requirements are in your state. Okay, awesome. Hey, Amy, do us a favor. Go ahead and share. Um, Jenny, you have a, a free ebook. You want to give uh, just a 30 second uh, explanation of what this is about? Because I want to kind of ask some questions about this in just a second. Amy, you want to go ahead and share what that link is for us? There you go. So it's a how to get a yes ebook. Is that right? Right. Yeah. And I actually have two ebooks. If you go to my website, jennycasson.com, you could see the other one too, which kind of shares more um, of the basics on how to know if you're ready to raise money. But this one is, you know, you know, you do want to go ahead and raise money and you are just terrified of talking to investors. And here's an interesting thing. Like, even if you do crowdfunding, you still need to talk to investors probably one-on-one. -on -one. I mean, a lot of people think like, oh, I'm just going to post it up on the internet and all these people are going to invest. And that <laughs> generally is not the case. Like when I, w I did crowdfunding for my business, I raised about 200,000. I, I posted it up on the internet. I sent out emails. I spoke at events about it. But when push comes to shove, you really have to talk to each person, even if they're only investing $1,000. They want to talk to you. I mean, not every, we got a few people that just invested because they knew us, you know, but. Yeah. Um, so it's that no like trust factor. Exactly. So whether you're doing crowdfunding or whether you're doing the quote unquote more traditional route of just talking one on one to investors, you need to get really comfortable with talking to investors. So this is a book that talks about how to prepare to talk to investors, how to get a meeting with an investor and then what to say in the meeting. So there's a couple of things I want to just I love leverage and, you know, we are talking about leveraging money, but with this e first ebook of really getting a yes from investors and being prepared, if you're prepared on uh, to be able to communicate your business at, to an investor, you would be prepared, like we were talking about one of our other ways of, of leveraging money, that sweat equity partnership of approaching a partner, you know, to to fund a marketing effort or a business growth strategy that was win-win. So this concept of really being prepared is is key. And I think um, one of the, oh golly, his name just went out of my mind. So, but um, one of the speakers that I was out there, he's a little red sales book and his name will come to me in just a second, but this is what happens some days for me. The name goes through, but he was talking about, he's like, if you're scared, then you're not prepared. So the best way not to be scared is to be prepared. Mm -hmm. So, you know, you've got to do your due diligence. So can you share with us just a couple of, of maybe one or two of your tips that are in this ebook that help people to get prepared to talk to investors? Sure. And I think, you know, it is true that these tips apply to all kinds of conversations, like even mm -hmm. with potential customers. Yeah. And and what I I actually have to say I don't totally agree with what you said about if you're scared you're not prepared. <laughs> because I am super prepared and I'm super scared all the time, you know, like <laughs> I almost feel like if you're not scared maybe you're doing something wrong, you know, because you need to be pushing yourself beyond your comfort zone and asking for an investment, even asking for a sale. It can be scary, but you have to just do it anyway. You know, like, yes, you're going to be scared. And I feel like if you wait till you're not scared, you're going to be waiting a long time. <laughs> <laughs> okay, valid point, valid point. <laughs> so, I'm like, and that's actually one of the first issues I address in this book is acknowledging the fact that you are going to be really scared and there's going to be a lot of things like negative self-talk that's going to come up uh -huh. when you – think about talking mm -hmm. to investors. So I share some tips about how to overcome that. And one of them is to be more aware of what the what's available to investors right now. A lot of people mm -hmm. think like, oh, why would anyone invest in my business? Like when they could invest in, I don't know what else, like they could just put their money in a mutual fund or 
in the bank or whatever. And it's like, you know what? Those options are not that great. Um, mm -hmm. the, a lot of people are really scared about the stock market. It's incredibly volatile. Also, a majority of people right now, believe it or not, a majority of people are very concerned with wanting to make sure that their investments are in alignment with their values. Mm -hmm. So a lot of people just don't feel great about putting their money into the stock market because they know, even if they're investing in a quote unquote socially responsible investment fund, a lot of the, the public companies out there, even the ones that are considered most uh, socially responsible, they really aren't doing, they're doing things in the world that a lot of us don't feel great about. Mm. Like, t for example, taking advantage of these major tax avoidance strategies. Like they, no matter how, like, I mean, Starbucks, like they do it. I mean, they have to do it. They, if they don't do it, their shareholders will sue them. So they're, <laughs> they are, they're doing things that are not good for our country and not good for people, you know, they're not good for the world in a lot of ways because they're avoiding tax. And t we need people to pay tax to cover expenses that, you know, for social services. But anyway, so that's just one example. So people don't realize how frustrated a lot of people are with their options in terms of where to put their money. Mm. And so if you offer them an opportunity to invest in your business and it's something that they really believe in, like let's say your business has something to do with um, – Gosh, like let's say you are manufacturing a, a, a snack that's super healthy and you were inspired to create that snack because your kids had multiple allergies. I'm actually talking about one of my clients right now. Her kids had multiple allergies but and there were things that were allergen free but they weren't healthy and they were t like cardboard and they were like super processed. So she created a healthy snack that is allergen free. And she is so passionate about that. And guess what? There are other people in the world that are passionate about nutrition and health and, you know, mm -hmm. protecting kids from these horrible allergies. And so those people would be great investors for her. And they would probably be more excited to invest in her business than in a mutual fund on the stock market. And guess what? If they meet her and they see that passion, they're going to be like, wow, you know, I'm not sure exactly what's going to happen with her business, but I know she's going to work her butt off to make it a success because this is her purpose in life, you know? So that's one thing is just to think through a little more uh, objectively about how excited someone might be to invest in your business. Well, and I love, you know, that's that preconceived notion of determining, you know, what the other people are thinking when you go walk into any opportunity and have that preconceived notion that they will think it's too expensive, won't want to invest with you, you know, you name it, the little monsters that talk in the back of your head, you can really shut down. But I think um, by and large, I just see so many people that just want to be a part of something. And like you were saying with your client with the nutritional bars, I mean, that's something I'm gluten free and dairy free. And I was sitting there walking through the grocery store the other day and I was like, I can't eat you know, so much of what's here. It's kind of crazy. I was like, it gets kind of boring to go to the grocery store. <laughs> You're like, I'm just not going to walk down aisle seven. Um, so it's, you know, something like that is exciting to the right people. Yeah. How do you really, um, how do you find the right people to that this will be exciting for? I mean, it's kind of like the marketing game, right? Of finding your ideal client on the marketing side. I'm imagining you need your ideal investor on, on this yes, side. Yes, exactly. That's funny you say that because that is a huge, it's, I don't cover that in this book, but I cover that in my other book because I, you have to make sure that before you start talking to investors, you have a clear picture of what you're looking for. That's one of the biggest mistakes I see people make is they'll just say, oh, I need to raise money and they'll just like set up meetings with anyone they can think of who might possibly invest and they waste so much time and it's very demoralizing. Mm -hmm. So if you take that time, like a, sometimes you're in a rush and you kind of just want to get going, but if you invest that time up front and I help my clients go through some exercises to help them, and there's actually that other free book I mentioned, which by the way, I think is at jennycasson.com slash gift. Okay. There's actually an exercise in there that you can go through to figure out who your ideal investors are, or at least to get a starting point to figure that out so that um, you can really target the right people and not waste time with the wrong people. 
Yeah, I'm going to let give Amy a second. I know we've had a few people, new people, trying to pop on. Amy, um, you want to give some shout outs? I know we've got some returned people here. I'm excited to see. Yeah, we have Craig um, Peliquin has come back, and um, Aaron Smith at the Starter Club is here again today, and Frank Clark has recently joined as well. Awesome. Guys, thanks for joining us. Um, we have put up a direct link to Jenny Kassan's um, ebook. She actually has two ebooks. Mm -hmm. You know, today we've been talking about um, doubling your business and how to do that without money. And I brought Jenny on because she really is an expert in a, a crowd funding that we're not used to hearing you know if you most of us know about kickstarter and gofundme and and jenny has explained that's kind of the perk based um crowdfunding but we've been learning a, a lot about another way to do crowdfunding that is you know if you're a private business you're perfect for you no matter what size of business it's perfect for you really the biggest constraint and how and which way you choose to do it because i know jenny's shared at least seven different ways i think to put this strategy into um impact it's all about the money that you want to raise and so it does depend on where you are how much you want to raise and you know the kind of the legality behind it and what you need to do to make sure you your ducks are all in a row and that you stay legal and and represent yourself well um but we've been talking about some of these tips haven't we jenny so lots of there's and i know we're just kind of scratching aren't we i have a feeling there's like a mountain behind this yeah. little scratch that we're itching today um but so we've talked about two books uh, go ahead and share what those two books are again. Amy's been sharing the link out there so that um, if y'all want to grab these ebooks, you're more than welcome to do that. But um, go ahead and tell us what those two books are again, Jenny. Yeah, so the first ebook I wrote was kind of uh, more of the basics for really thinking about bringing on investors, um, you know, how to figure out who your ideal investors are, uh, et cetera. And, and that's actually jennycasson.com slash gift. And I think Amy shared another link. Those both of those links will get you there. And then um, the second ebook I wrote is is kind of more specific. It's about if you know that you do want to raise money and you kind of already know who your ideal investors are, how to actually prepare for the meeting, get the meeting, and what to say in the meeting. How long does this whole process take? From like the moment you know that somebody would come to you because we we pretty much identified there's enough legality issues that you needed to stand on the shoulder of a giant on this guy but from the, the moment they come to you to the moment that they're um i guess fully funded on what they're trying to do how long does that process take it varies there's like a lot of different factors to it if you're using a legal compliance strategy that requires approval from a regulator that can add three to four months oh. to the process. <laughs> yeah. So, you know, unfortunately, yeah. So that is a shame. But you know what? If you, it, it can be very worth it, you know, because I've had clients that have gone through that process and been frustrated by how long it takes. But um, once it, it allows you to go out and publicly advertise and bring in anyone as an investor, and it, it can be really worth it. Um, but I've even had clients that didn't, you know, require that still take quite a long time because they, you know, a lot of people get slowed down by, it's very scary for them to go out and do it. So they'll put it last mm -hmm. on their list of things to do. And then I've had other clients, like I have a client right now who I just started working with a couple months ago and she's already brought in her first two investors. So um, it's, it really varies. It depends on how busy you are, how willing you are to make it a high priority. Also, there's decisions that need to be made. Like, for example, you have to decide what you want to offer. And that's a really yeah. important decision because it can have a big effect on the future of your business. Like, am I going to offer um, equity with voting rights? Like, if you offer equity with voting rights, then that's going to affect your future in a lot of ways. So, um, so taking the time to really figure out what you want to offer. Do I want to do equity? Do I want to do debt? Do I want to give my investors voting rights? You know, how much of the company do I want to sell if I'm selling equity? How am I going to plan ahead for how they're going to get their money back out at some point? So some of my clients are pretty clear on that and we can, you know, work through that in an hour. I have other clients where they've taken months going back and forth like, oh, I don't know. I don't know. <laughs> 
yeah, some big decisions in there. Frank, uh, Frank Clark is kind of re-echoing some of the things we had talked about, and it's good to bring this back up because it's very true. Depending on how much you're raising and where your investor audience, and if you're going in state or out of yeah. state, or you know, there are a lot of different regulations and a lot of different laws to kind of. Yeah. Um, <laughs> Keep in mind. Thanks for that <laughs> gift. That's really relevant. That's exactly. <laughs> Everybody loves dogs, right? <laughs> so, uh, you know, there, there's a lot of things to kind of keep in here. But I think some of the the overriding things that we've been talking about is there is a vehicle for you to do this. You just need to follow the rules, you know, and, and make sure you're buttoned up legally and that you're positioned well and be able to do this. And this is, I think, a strategy that most small businesses, private businesses would never have thought they could do for themselves. Mm -hmm. And so that's one of the things I like about having you on today. Well, we, um, we are getting towards the end of the show, guys. I haven't seen very many questions, although we still have this repeating chihuahua that's going to crack me up um, in the chat box going on. So if you have a question for Jenny that we can answer today, that would be great. Um, I'm going to give Jenny, you know, Jenny, let's do one more kind of, you know, we've talked about so much. We've got maybe about five, six minutes left in our show. What uh, What's one thing that we just haven't touched on that you think is really important for somebody to hear today? Mm -hmm. Oh, gosh. It's always such a hard question. I know. <laughs> well, you did such a good job. You covered so much. Um, you know, I guess just to me what I'm hearing a lot out there as I talk about what I do, a lot of people have a lot of misconceptions about who can raise money from investors. I talk to mm -hmm. people and they say, like, Oh no, that I could never do that, you know, and I'm like, yes, you can. So uh, I think that's the key is just to realize that it is possible. And a lot of the ways that you hear about doing it will sound like the kind of the shark tank style of, um, oh, you're talking to these really mean, scary people <laughs> that are going to make, you know, that are going to demand to own like a majority of your company. And then they're probably going to fire you the minute they become an investor. That is one way of raising money, but there's so many other ways. I mean, I pretty much won't let my clients raise money that way. I, all, Pretty much all my clients are um, raising money from investors that have no say in the management of the company, whether they're offering equity or debt. That's a lot of, mm -hmm. that's another misconception is people think like, oh, I don't want to give equity because I don't want to lose control of my company. But there's so many different ways to structure it. It doesn't have to be that way. So just realize it may be right for you and there's many different ways to do it so just learn as much as you can about what the options are there's some i didn't share any real a lot of examples today of my clients who have raised money but they're so diverse they're at such different stages their businesses are so different they are different places in the country you know so it's a great thing to kind of see a bunch of different examples so you can start to see like, oh, if they did it, I could probably do it. And I'm happy to, you know, if people are interested, I can email you some examples of people who have successfully raised money or even are currently, I have some clients that are currently raising money publicly. You could even invest in one of them if you wanted to. <laughs> <laughs> you know, we did get one question in from Frank Clark at Frank Clark Coach. Uh -huh. And his question is, do you raise capital directly or work with brokers and dealers? Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's a good question. So I personally don't really work with broker dealers and I myself am not a broker. Um, and the reason for that is I feel like a lot of uh, broker dealers will only work on deals where they're pretty large uh, because that way they can get compensated well and also and they also need uh, usually need to be paid up front for their services and I've heard a lot of horror stories where they'll pay people pay a broker dealer to help them raise money and they won't see results and I actually believe when you're raising money you know how we always say it's really good to delegate stuff as you grow your business one thing that I can say wouldn't not recommend delegating and that's raising me from investors. Um, investors want to hear from you. You know, it's your baby. You're the one who has the passion about it. Don't think like, oh, I don't have to, I don't have to go out and do this myself. I'm going to get a broke dealer to help me go raise money and tell people, you know, tell investors about it. No, just go out and do it yourself. You'll save money that way because you won't have to pay that fee to the broker dealer and you'll be, you'll have more success because that's 
people want to hear from you? Well, and I think, you know, even with what Frank is, if Frank has another question out there, but what Frank is bringing up is there are so many different ways to go down the channel of raising investments. And we're kind of, I think, on the spectrum of really big businesses and really small businesses and everything in between. What we've been talking about is, you know, on the smaller end of things, people that are probably not looking to raise $500 million and therefore it might make better sense to have a broker in place. Mm -hmm. But, you know, smaller numbers um, that really kind of, have that that small business in mind um because you mentioned minimally a hundred thousand two hundred and fifty thousand um you know we've talked all the way up we've heard million uh, you know kind of around there and that's kind of in that smaller business kind of range um i'm gonna go ahead and um <laughs> you want me to answer frank's question or do we are we out of time he, he added We're Go I ahead and let's the answer. important point, actually, that he okay, raises, go ahead and answer. He mentions this thing about finders, and this is something you do have to be careful about. You will see, thank you, Frank, for bringing this up. People will advertise like, oh, I'm a finder. I'm going to go out and I may, and by the way, this is a highly regulated thing. So if they're not licensed uh, by the, uh, you know, if they're not a member of FINRA, which is the agency that regulates this, um, or anyway, and they say, oh, I'm going to go out and find you some investors and you can just pay me a fee for that or a percentage. You should not do that because chances are they are doing that outside the law and the whole thing will mm. be breaking the law. And a lot of those people really are end up not being very effective. So just do it yourself. You can do it. <laughs> You can do it. Um, you know, we are kind of coming to the end of the show. Jenny, thank you so much for sharing so much with us. I know we, like I said, just kind of scratching the tip of the iceberg when it comes to this issue. Um, but there are ways that you can build cash in your business. It doesn't necessarily have to be from your bank account. Um, there are a lot of smart ways to do it, but this would be definitely, I think if you've heard, listened to most of the show, a way to do it with an expert. <laughs> um, just a little too many um, loopholes and snags that you can get into that could um, hurt your position down the line. So you wanna be smart about these things. Uh, a couple of things, you know, this show is all about doubling your business in 90 days. We're on every Monday at 1.30 live. So if you like this show, subscribe. Next week's show is going to be about sales and really defining the problem that you solve and how that can really impact who you're attracting and how much you can charge in, um, in this. So yeah, definitely catch this replay. I think we shared a lot of deep stuff and we tend to share um, some pretty good stuff on this show so it's always valid to go back and have that replay but if you are um, in here and you want I've got a, a gift that I love to share with this and I'll have Amy Amy's already popped it up there but you know there like I said there are 169 ways that you can grow your business we've just talked about one way that even had you know it was like one topic with seven different ways to do it in here so you can really see that it it there are a lot of opportunities for you to you to grow your business you just need the one right way so I invite you to kind of share uh, take that if you um, if this crowdfunding and crowd investment seems like it's a way that you want to talk contact Jenny for sure because she's going to be able to be that expert for you we talked about there's not a whole lot of people that are concentrating on this market so um, definitely take advantage of her ebooks and the information there and then grab your 169 ways to grow your business in the next 90 days um, Ginny, do you have any parting words for us? Thank you so much for sharing so much. Yeah, well, thank you. This was so much fun. I love it. I love what you're doing, and I so appreciate you including me. And yeah, I just, I believe me, it's a scary thing to go out and raise money, but that doesn't mean you shouldn't go out and do it anyway. You definitely can. <laughs> <laughs> you can do it. Yes. <laughs> All right, guys, that's it for today's show. Be sure to join us um, next Monday at 1.30. You can catch the replay here on Blab or on the yourbizrules.com site um, or on iTunes. So I'm going to leverage it to the hilt so you can watch it or listen to it wherever you need to watch or listen to it. Um, but until then, we will be talking with you soon. Go out and have a profitable week. You know, do that one thing that's going to drive your business forward. Um, and if you did that one thing, the next week you can do another one thing. So that's all for today, guys. Thanks so much. <laughs>